So this is the setup. Um, so we we proceeded with this calculation the similar way we did the electric field calculation uh, using Coulomb's law. Um, remember that that was a while ago, and you know when we did it. Essentially, the point of me doing it was to tell you this is not how you want to calculate electric field. You want to use Gauss's law. Um, so this process is similarly. The only difference is, you know, with the electric field, you could deal with a point charge. With the magnetic field, this is the simplest example I can give you. So, um, all right, so we'll uh, go through it the same way we did it uh, before. As in, we are going to first identify a segment of the loop that we are going to look at, see what kind of magnetic field it produces here, and go on from there. Now, normally, I would try to pick some generic portion of the ring, right? So that this can represent with some parameterization, um, let's see, from the y-axis, parameterization, and angle phi, I can then describe the rest using this generic segment. For this one, I'm going to be a little bit more careful because there's going to be some complications. So let me pick this the top segment. I can pick that without lo any loss of generality. You know, assume just whatever segment I picked, I rotated it to make it the top here. So, um, so I'm looking at the contribution to the magnetic field at this point due to a small segment of wire at the very top from a small segment of wire at the very top. So, um, so on the perspective view is where I can indicate the uh, length of DL. Now, what is the direction of the wire segment to DL? Is it within the plane? Is it out of the plane or into the plane? Like looking at the direction of the current that I have drawn. So out of the plane, right? Same direction as the current. So the DL here points outward or out of the plane. All right. Um, the R in Bio Savart's law, it stands for the distance uh, between the section of the current that you are, or s section of the wire that you are looking at and the point. So this is the distance R. Do we have enough information to write down what R is in terms of all the known quantities here? Yes? Pythagorean theorem, R, uh, big R and X. So this distance is the square root of R squared plus X squared, then I'll be using that. Um, all right, so to end this um, diagram, I need the direction of R hat. This is R hat. What direction is R hat pointing in? Uh, it's straight in the positive x direction, or is it a combination of x and some other directions? OK, which other direction? <laughs> Motion for me, what direction is generally going? Um, pointing up? OK, OK. Um, so let me start from here. Uh, tell me which point is the correct direction for R hat to be going. There, <laughs> there right? <laughs> so, you know, this is the direction for R hat. It's, uh, you know, it takes a while getting used to, but it is an intuitive direction. The R hat is the unit vector pointing from the source, whether it's a charge or current, from the source to the target point. Um, but, you know, it's worth the drawing because uh, it's, Without, yeah, anyway. So R hat, so R hat points in that way. So um, let me draw a separate diagram that illustrates all these vectors so that my drawing here doesn't get clogged up. So um, all these vectors, DL, that's coming out of the board, and my R hat, that's pointing down this way. So what I would like to know is what is the direction of DL cross R hat? Is it in the plane of the board, or is it somewhere in Torah? In the plane? OK. So in the plane of the board, there are many directions it can point. Uh, which direction is it pointing? Hmm? OK, perpendicular to our head. That's good. So that means I have these two possible choices. Which one? One or two? 
Yeah, that's where you have to use right hand rule. <laughs> All right, yeah, so it's the one, this one, right? So that's the direction for DL cross, uh, DL cross R hat. So let me draw that here. So DL cross R hat, it should point in a direction that looks like this. And I might, um, for clarity's sake, I might indicate that this is perpendicular, because that's how I'm trying to draw it. Okay? And uh, in fact, this DL cross R hat, that is the direction of the magnetic field, or the small contribution to the magnetic field. So I'm going to replace this with just the dB. Okay? Now, here's the difficulty. <laughs> Um, does this look like, um, one, is this in the direction that you intuitively thought the direction of magnetic field was? Like intuitively, what would you say the direction of magnetic field is at this point? Just straight along the axis, right? That's what we drew here. So that's what your intuition says. Um, this is not in that direction, um, which must mean that the component that's perpendicular to the axis is somehow canceling out. So you need to make this argument that component that's perpendicular to the axis is going to go away when you add up all the contributions. So this is where um, you look for what other part of this loop will cancel out when you added the contribution to this, they will cancel out the uh, perpendicular component and leave you only with the component along axis. And looking at here, I think I'm going to go with this. Everyone agrees? Yes? So on this perspective drawing, it would be this segment here. When you consider the contribution here, so R hat points in this direction, that's my R hat. DL points out of the board. So go through the same exercise, DL cross R hat. Oops, uh, DL cross R hat. Thumb. I'm not doing this right. Uh, so DL, oh no, sorry, DL is pointing into the board. <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> DL cross R hat. Okay, so my thumb is pointing this way. So contribution due to this um, portion is down here. This is the DB and um, perpendicular to this. So you see the symmetry between the top and the bottom. So, um, so you know, this is the mirror image. And so I guess the last piece I need is I need to be able to argue that the magnitude of this is same as magnitude of this. As in, is everything here the same for both of them? Yeah, right, current is the same. And R, you can go through, oh, this is the same radius R, same X, so, you know. So they are the same in magnitude. So when you add these two together, the resultant vector is going to go only along the axis. Okay. So once you figure that out, then, um, then for the rest of the calculation, you simply look at the x component of the magnetic field with the confidence that any y or z component of magnetic field will simply cancel out. And if I was doing, you know, picking this um, generic element, then what I imagine doing for this generic element is I imagine picking another generic element right across from that, and these two will cancel out in any component that's perpendicular. So I think I mentioned the name of this technique before. This is called pairwise cancellation. And it, it comes up a lot. It, um, so um, it, it's a useful technique. Um, and um, there's a reason uh, I didn't do this question the same way I did some of the electricity questions where I simply write down unit vector representation and simply go ahead and do the integral. Uh, because here it's beginning to get complicated. So it's worth going through this step to figure out, oh, I only need the x component. That's the only component I'm going to worry about. OK, so with that, I think I have everything I need to actually set up the actual calculation. So this is what I'm going to say. I'm going to say my magnetic field, or the magnitude of my magnetic field, is going to be the sum, or integral, over all these small contributions around the, added around the loop. And I'm only going to add up the contribution to the x component. 
because I'm going to say y and z component, they're going to cancel out. So, all right, I have a law that tells me what this is. That's the bio subvert law. So this is, once again, another reason magnetism is complicated. The very basic application of bio subvert law involves an integral. So, all right, let me write this all out. So I'm still going to imagine integrating around the loop, but let me write all of that down. So it's uh, mu naught um, i over 4 pi um, r. I'm going to take care to write down this r. So r squared, that's um, just the square root squared, r squared plus x squared. All right, um, so I took care of mu naught i 4 pi r squared. Uh, okay, so I need to write the magnitude of dl cross r hat. Um, dl and r hat, are they 90 degrees? Or are they, as, so you know, dl is pointing this way, r hat is pointing this way. Are they 90 degrees or some other angle I need to be worried? 90 degrees, right? So that makes things nice for me, meaning that makes the magnitude of this simply magnitude of dl. Right? R hat is a unit vector, and the sine theta is just one. So it will be just the magnitude of DL. And now I have to take care of this taking the x component portion. That's why I've been drawing this diagram so that I can figure out what the x component is. If I label this as my angle theta, then I can represent the x component. So this would be my dvx, I can represent my x component as the magnitude times cosine theta, right? Yes? So the easy impulse is to simply write in cosine theta here. But let me go through one more step so that I can actually express this integrand in terms of things I know, because theta is a new symbol I just introduced. So I want to re-express theta in terms of all these geometric quantities that, um, that, that you know, I know. So uh, does anyone remember this technique that we use? I think we've used it maybe one, once or twice in this class. Well, yeah, as I said, we used it once or twice. So this technique is called drawing the triangle. So uh, I want to draw a triangle that has theta as a part, one of it draw the right triangle that has theta as, as one of its angles, and that'll help me um, that, that'll help me figure out how to express cosine of theta in terms of other things I know. So here, the, um, the triangle that I know most about is actually this triangle, right? I know both of its legs, and I know the hypotenuse. So the easiest thing to do is to locate theta somewhere in this triangle, if that's possible. Now, would this be angle theta? When you look at it carefully, it should be no. Like even if you know you say this is theta, like they, they don't actually align. So, but this is theta. This is 90 degrees, which means this must be 90 degrees minus theta, which means actually this is theta. Okay? So now that I have the triangle, cosine theta is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So that's how I can write down cosine theta here. So this would be times uh, adjacent capital R over the hypotenuse, square root of R squared plus X squared. So that's the, this is the cosine theta that's taking the X component. Yeah. It's on, uh, forgetting that um, um, taking the component is a really easy mistake to make. I can tell you guys how many, like when I take the, when I was taking the upper division electrodynamics, like I do all the calculations, I thought I did it correctly, and the answer's wrong, it turns out I forgot this component. Like that's what happens. So, all right, uh, let's uh, try to finish this calculation. I need to do one more thing. So I'm going to imagine uh, integrating around the loop. So I have to parameterize this integral. I have to express it in terms of some uh, coordinate variable. So I kind of started doing that here because I was using phi as a coordinate variable I can use to address this portion and then go all the way around the 2 pi to go over around the whole loop. So it's a question of 
how do I re-express this DL in terms of phi? Anybody here know the answer already? Yeah, RD phi. The way to look at it is this DL is the arc length. So how do you express arc length in terms of angle? Well, radius of the circle times the, the small change in angle. Good, so that's it. Um, so I'm going to rewrite this as R d phi. All right, uh, and uh, the integral for the loop would be uh, phi going from 0 to 2 pi. So let me write all of that out here. Um, and I'm going to skip one step and sort of uh, factor out in front anything that doesn't depend on phi. Yeah. So this whole thing is equal to, let me pull out all the constants, mu naught over 4 pi. Um, does i depend on the angle phi? No, it's the same current, so let me pull that out. Um, does either r or x depend on phi? When you look at this here? Yeah, um, it's, yeah, it doesn't depend. Um, and though here's where I was careful to use two different letters for two different angles. R and X are related to theta, but theta is not what we are integrating over. This is what we are integrating over. So let me pull out this. Actually, I'm going to combine this into one single expression. So it's uh, R squared plus X squared raised to the power of 3 halves. You know, 2 over 2 plus 1 half. All right. I'm took care of this, 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 this. Oh, I have this r and this r here. Uh, we just said r doesn't depend on phi, so I can factor out r squared as well. Um, did I factor out everything? Yeah, well, I did say this was the easiest example. So the integral is integral of d phi, where phi goes from 0 to 2 pi. So um, I did tell you this was the simplest example. So the integral here does turn out to be simple. Um, all this is, is this is simply equal to 2 pi. So it's like taking this, multiply by 2 pi. That will give you the answer. So let me just write it out. Um, 2 pi cancels out um, some of this 4 pi. And you end up with mu naught i r squared over 2 r squared plus x squared three halves. So this is the magnetic field due to a loop of current. Um, this is the along the axis, uh, so the, the, the loop, um, along axis. So this is along the axis where x can be, um, the x is the distance from the um, axis. Uh, some features to note. Um, so when x is equal to 0, this becomes a simple expression involving just the constant and r. And um, so uh, let me write that down, because it's kind of hard to imagine it in your head. So when, uh, when x is, so if x is equal to 0, then this simplifies down to mu naught i over r squared gets canceled out by r to the third power. So it get, becomes 2r. And um, so this is a, a limiting case where x is equal to 0. Does this expression make sense? That if uh, you have a loop, it's carrying some current. And if you make the loop larger, then the uh, magnetic field at the center would become smaller. That makes sense, right? Um, sort of, that's the inverse square law portion. Now, you know, it doesn't look like a distance squared because of this complicated integral you have to do. But, you know, it's still in the correct direction. If the loop is larger, so you're at a farther distance, magnetic field is smaller. Um, so that's one way. Um, and the other way you can make sense of it is, let's say you keep the r the same, but you get very, very far away in the x direction. Then how does this magnetic field change? How does this magnetic field change as a function of x? What is it proportional to? Is it proportional to 1 over x, 1 over x squared, 1 over x to the third power? So I have x squared, taking square root, and then raising it to the third power. 
So it's proportional to 1 over x to the third power, right? And um, so I've, I've, we didn't cover this in electricity. I wish I had. Um, so this is uh, how a dipole field uh, looks like very far away. So this is the, uh, this is the dipole uh, field um, 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 distance dependence. So I really should have done this when we covered electricity. And next semester, I will. <laughs> but if you do this kind of calculation with the electric dipole, that's what you would have seen, that um, with some two charges separated by some distance, if you look at electric field very far away, the electric field would go as 1 over x to the cubed. So what you are seeing with this magnetic loop is that the magnetic field, due to a loop of current, looks like uh, something that would be due to a dipole. And that, what that means is that, um, so you know, we were asking this question earlier. So you, know, you guys are all used to dealing with you know, these permanent magnets, magnetic dipoles. But we kept saying, this is not a uh, elementary object. Like, it's too complex for us to consider. And that's why we were going to, into the description how magnetic field can be generated by something that's elementary as a uh, flowing charge. And what we are seeing here is that when you get the charges to flow in a loop, then those charges flowing in a loop produces a field that looks like a dipole field. And in fact, if I drew all these field lines out of, into some larger space, these will look like a dipole field. So this current loop is the, the very basic way you can model magnetic dipoles. Now, as I said on Monday, um, it does get complicated. The whole ferromagnetism, paramagnetism, diamagnetism, it involves quantum mechanics, and we are not going to get into that. But if we want to model it in terms of something fundamental like a current, then we can say, well, wherever you have magnetic dipole, there, there must be some kind of current loop that we can imagine that's producing that dipole field. Okay. So um, yeah, so that's a simplest example. As I said, it's pretty simple. Um, the integral that I was dreading turns out to be just the multiplication by 2 pi. <laughs>